Hey, uh, so I'll, I'll go through a lot of material over the next 40 minutes or so, and uh, I'll end with a certain video that was recently produced by our team. Uh, we have a science team working with our organization in the United States. Um, I'm going to be following up on what JP said, by, but first before I begin my actual uh, presentation, which is going to go through a lot of material, and I really do hope I can get it done in a dense amount of time. Um, I'm assuming it's not a, a big revelation or surprise for people here to discover that we live in a neoliberal economic system. That's popular to say that, right? It's, it's not working. That doesn't funk, right? That's common, commonly understood by all. Um, if I said that at the heart of it, there, that it's based upon an idea of social Darwinism, would that make any sense to people, or is there confusion there? That there's a social Darwinistic uh, ideology underpinning yeah. the system. That makes sense, right? No, not so much? Okay, well, in the current system, um, do you know the principle, or have you heard of this idea of each against all, the survival of the fittest? Yeah. Do you, rec do you, do you see how that uh, concept justifies the expansion of monopolies like Monsanto, you know, major uh, corporate interests, right? You, you recognize that, right? The reason why I'm saying that is that a lot of people, uh, they don't think about the system in which they live in. There's sort of like a, series of a bunch of rules, a bunch of customs that you're born into, and you don't really think too deeply about the ideas and concepts underlying it. Um, that's partially to do with the fact that our education system is not some ivory tower objective place of learning outside of the political conditions of the world that we're living in. So if you live under an empire, it's, it goes without saying that every aspect of the world that you live in, be it the media, be it the uh, cultural programming, the educational systems, are going to reflect that same imperial uh, policy top down. So that's why there's a, there's a certain handicap in our population to jump be behind the surface of things to look at what is the underlying intention, what is the agenda moving us in a certain direction. Because if people did have that basic capability, which animals don't have, by the way, animals don't have that, what I, what I just mentioned, animals don't do that. They, they have a certain adaptive quality. There's a certain natural creative instinct that is very useful for them. It's very good, but they can't leap outside of their senses and tap into a sense of causality. So gravity is not something that you know uh, a pigeon is going to discover. They're going to react to the electromagnetic field of the Earth, but they're not going to discover the laws of electromagnetism, gravity. They're not going to be able to change their behavior through any act of will. That's just not what they're going to do. Whereas human beings, the fact that we doesn't mean we do, doesn't mean that human beings do this, but the fact that we have exhibited a quality that separates us from other animals in that we have this power if we choose to develop it is very special. And what I'm going to be going through with my presentation that I, I just chose to call the end of closed system geopolitics and the rise of open system development is going to touch on this scientific idea of what human beings actually are. Um, if you think about the idea of a neoliberal economic system of free trade economics, uh, you, you, you look then at all the, the idea of geopolitics. What we teach in, if you go to a political science program today, you learn about geopolitics. You guys heard about geopolitics? Yeah? Okay, what, what does that mean to you guys? Geopolitics. What do you got? Okay, that's that's a, that's a, that's one one approach to it. Yeah, every every country has its own customs and rules that interact with each other. Um, underlying that, the idea of geo of the earth, politics of the earth, it pretty much uh, the geography. This is where the idea originally came from a hundred years ago, with a, a major imperialist and a racist named Lord, Lord Halford Mackinder, who formulated this whole school of thought. His idea was that well, look, the earth is pretty much everything is discovered. Everything that could be discovered has been discovered, and now it's just a question of the powerful, or the, the most genetically fit to rule, mapping out everything else and managing the diminishing resources, knowing that you have these different cultures that have their own quirks, their own customs, and you know the idea, if you're truly the, the most fit, will be to have the control of the, um, of what are called the geopolitical pivots, right? If you can control the maritime routes of trade, which is what the British Empire always did, if you can control profile cultures and have them play against each other so that they have artificial wars for you know, water, for oil, whatever, 
they're going to be so busy fighting each other that they're not going to realize that they're all being played by the same forces, who maybe they both think is their friends, right? And this goes back to a very, this is an old formula. It's gotten a little bit more complex in recent years, but it's the same old formula since Babylon. You play the slaves against each other so that they don't actually think, think together, okay? Now, we're coming to an end of that system. What's collapsing now is a system that does not define, the imperial system does not define any differentiation between animal life in the biosphere and human life. We are just another form of animal, and all we're supposed to do under the imperial ethic is adapt to whatever system we're born into. We're not allowed to question if that's true or not. We just have to adapt to it, try to get ahead, right? try to have more, make more money than the, the weaker, and then you die, and there's no real other purpose beyond that. Now that's the imperial ethic. That's what, when you're looking at what's collapsing right now, in Europe and the, in North America, especially with the austerity, with the bailouts, uh, you've got a system which LaRouche in the 90s first illustrated, in this form at least, um, as the, what's called the triple curve. This doesn't mean that everything you need to know about economy is, is illustrated here, but this means that the, the primary elements of what are, what's driving us towards a collapse can be understood through this, this mechanism, but through this graph. What this graph is, as people see, are three variables, right? This is what we're living in. You got monetary aggregates. As you know, since 2008, when our economy collapsed, then we, we created a bailout economy to replace what we used to have as an economy. That, those monetary flows have just been increasing. We've been pumping out over 27 trillions of dollars in five years just to keep the banks from collapsing. That's big. What's, what they've been pumping out and trying to bail out are these uh, derivative contracts, speculative contracts that people are realizing they thought they had value, they have no value. They're, they're associated with debts that are not payable. So as these things just disappear, well, you've got to pump, pump the banks you know, with more of the more quantitative easing. You've got to flood it with liquidity. Now, where does that debt go? That private, privately incurred losses in the private sector, these major monopoly, too big to fail banks, they don't just disappear. What's been happening now is that you have the private debts transferred onto the public shoulders. This is where, the, if you want to get at the heart of why we have austerity, it's because you've got a system where private speculators have been tricking people into uh, bringing, pu making public those losses and then convincing us that it's our fault and we have to submit to the you know, blood-curdling austerity in everything that actually has real value. Now, the, the key part, and what Bruce has been saying, is the, the key to the reason why he has been able to, as a 92-year-old scientist, the reason why he has been able to go on record for five decades and make long-term forecasts about what the economy is doing is not magic. It's the fact that he's just simply paying attention to the most important variable, which is the physical, economic, input, output, industry, science, and infrastructure. Right? This is, again, this is not magic. This is not esoteric. This is basic science. If you have 7 billion people on the Earth, you cannot produce enough food for 6 billion or 5 billion while having money go up. So you can't contract your means of sustaining life while making money happen and expect that money to be worth anything. If you do that, and if you let any rules get ingrained that permits that process to happen, as we see right there, where you have like literally about two quadrillion dollars of derivative contrast, contracts in the system with only about $70 trillion of so-called GDP, that's a big discrepancy. There's like 40 times more derivatives in the system than there is actual GDP. You're fucked. Like your, your system is going to collapse. Right? That, and that's not, that's, I'm, I'm assuming that people recognize that you can't produce less than your system consumes if you want your system to not collapse, right? Basic with sense. certainty. Oh, yeah, with certainty. Now, the question remains, well, what is uh, a truly natural uh, standard of value when we judge what our society is doing politically and, economy, and, and about the economy? We've got right now these two systems rising. You've got the BRICS system, which seems to be going for no austerity. We don't see budget cuts going through the BRICS countries. What we're seeing is trillions of dollars of investments into uh, high technology, industrialization, new energy corridors, rail systems, and the point is it's not being done unilaterally, as you have with a lot of countries in the West, which for a specific country or two in the West. What you have is a move towards what JP was going through, right? You've got a, a benefit of the other. People are, there's a look a lookout for common ground of mutual development and mutual benefit in the programs that are being put forth. 
common sense. You don't want to make your neighbor your enemy. So you want to look for places where we'll, what we have in common more than what separates us, which is we all, have, we all need water, we all need to think, we all need energy. So let's work on those things and put our differences aside for a little bit. And maybe we'll find that we have more in common than we thought we did at the beginning. Again, somewhat common sense, and this used to be understood more clearly in the West. It's not anymore. Um, the <clears throat> Xi Jinping, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of quotes you can take from Narendra Modi, from Dilma Rousseff, from Jacob Zuma, especially in the last several months. So I chose to ch pick, pick this one from Xi Jinping, knowing what JP was going to go through, uh, that he delivered in a speech at the July Brasilia summit in Fortaleza, Brazil, when they unveiled the new development bank as, as an actual uh, system outside of the IMF's control, where he writes, history teaches us that the law of the jungle is not the pathway for the coexistence of humanity. All nations should follow the same principle of trust, learning from each other, work together in collaboration to the common advantage, and create a harmonious world, lasting peace for the general welfare. Now again, a lot of people say this, they, they see this, they chuckle, they're like, I oh, asked yeah, what he says, but what does he really mean, right? Uh, yeah, it's Chinese, right? You know, we get a lot of ignorance in our society, right? But they're always looking for an, a, high, a hidden agenda because we're, we're used to live, living in a world with a lot of hypocrisy and a lot of layered corruption. So we're just really jaded. <laughs> but then you actually look at the programs like JP went through and you look at the hundreds of rail development projects that are being put into place right now, the water projects that are being put into place, in Africa, South America, all over Eurasia. And then you look at space exploration, and the only countries that are actually taking an, ini an initiative right now on space exploration in a serious fashion are China, and this is the view from the Chang'e uh, lander, which just recently landed uh, last year on the surface of the moon, with the Jade Rabbit there over in the, in the, in the horizon. This is one component of a multi-phased operation that the Chinese have committed to, which involves the intention to access helium-3 from the moon. <clears throat> and a lot of people don't even know that. The head of the Chinese space program made the announcement that their intention is to access helium-3 and other rare earths on the moon. Because, frankly, if you don't get fusion power, and helium-3 is the primary, most efficient source of fusion power, our society is not going to have much chance of survival on the current energy basket that we, that we have right now. So this is a policy orientation. India has a program right now uh, for, for Mars. They, for $75 million, they were able to get a, a satellite around Mars. First country in the world to do it on the first try. And that was one third the price of Avatar. <laughs> <laughs> so you actually have an, an intention to utilize the type of creative resources and activate something within your population based upon a future potential, knowing that the current system is collapsing, knowing that everything else has been tried and has failed. So, there's a little bit of, there's, there's actually action. People are putting action where their mouths are. So, <clears throat> hmm? Hmm, sorry, I thought I something. So you've got rail, you've got space, you've got development, you've got a future orientation, then you've got uh, self-destruction in the West. Now, but the point I'm gonna use here as my, as in, my narrative for my presentation, I'm gonna be utilizing the discoveries of a very important Russian-Ukrainian scientist named Vladimir Ivanovich Bernadsky, who was a guy who was born in 1863, he died in 1946. Not a lot of people in Canada have heard about him. I didn't hear about him before I joined this, this organization. This guy is like a hero in Russia, he, and for rightly so. There's like a national holiday for this guy. He's like the father of Russian science. He, he founded the Ukrainian, Russian, uh, the Ukrainian Academy of Sciences. LaRouche has made the point that and LaRouche, by the way, is a member of the Russian Academy of Sciences, my, my boss. And the reason why is because the, the reason why the Russians made him such is because he mastered Vernadsky and, rec and understood it better than most of the best Russian scientists ever. And they recognized that his discoveries in economic forecasting, which were tied to what Vernadsky was doing, um, were really important. Let's just put it that way, really, really big. And it hasn't been accepted, it's such a big idea, that it hasn't been accepted by uh, society at large so far. But people are waking up. Vernadsky, um, and we'll go through a little bit about what he was, but <clears throat> he was a, um, his, he was born into a, a Abraham Lincoln loving uh, family. So he had a portrait of Abraham Lincoln in his, in his uh, dining room when he was a kid. His dad was a, a Russian economist who worked with Mendeleev, who was also not just the founder of the, the periodic table of elements, but also the, the 
uh, head of the Russian uh, protective tariff system. It's okay. So Mendeleev was the guy who brought in Abraham Lincoln's economic program with a bunch of other similarly minded people into Russia to develop the Trans-Siberian Rail Corridors in opposition to the British system. Uh, this, was, this was at the time spreading around the world and Bernatsky came out of this movement towards um, thinking about national development in conjunction with your, 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 out, your, your neighbors. So the whole American system principle of Lincoln, not what we have today, when I say American system, I don't mean what we have today right now. What America has become is a colony of the British imperial system. That's, the, that's, that's neoliberalism. The former American system, which you can go through on the website, is very different. And it was based not on money, it wasn't based on free markets, it was based upon developing the productive powers of labor. And the monetary system, any money that was in, in your society was actually credit tied to projects. If there were projects being built, the money had no justification. You could study that, and we encourage you to do so on the website and get out the original material, but um, Vernaski came from this outlook. And what he did revolutionized how we see uh, the nature of man and the biosphere and the lithosphere, which I'm going to go through in a bit more detail, but quickly, um, he wrote in 1943, towards the end of his life, that the whole of mankind put together represents an insignificant mass of the planet's matter. Its strength is derived not from its matter, but from its brain. If man understands this and does not use his brain and his work for self-destruction, an immense future is open before him in the geological history of the planet. So, obviously, you know, you're coming out of World War II, you now have the atom that's begun to, it's, it's becoming understood what exactly this atom is and how much power people are discovering is located in what they thought were just these in insignificant particles making up all of material existence. And obviously, there's two pot potential futures. Either we recognize our higher nature as a creative species, or we just continue on in our barbaric ways and we go for self-destruction with this power. Because obviously, great power can solve a lot of great problems, but it could also cause a lot, too. If, so there's, there's a moral principle, right? Now... <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes, sir. The, um, Bernaski. Mm -hmm. He was born in 18... 63? Yeah, at the end of the Civil War in the U.S. It was a typo. It was just a typo. It was right in 1963. Oh, yeah, that would be absurd. Yeah, that would, that would be time reversal, and that's weird. He yeah. died before he was born. Uh, right, exactly. Right, right. That'd be... No, that would be a paradox. Sorry. Uh, and I apologize now for any further typos that we will come across in the course of this presentation. That's my disclaimer. So, okay, so what, what he's asking when we're dealing with with human beings is what are we really looking at? Well, he's like, the first point is don't, don't just assume anything. Don't assume that, we, that money has value. Don't assume that resources just have value. He says, okay, before we do that, let's just look at what, is, what are we dealing with? And you're dealing with material and immaterial processes, right, in nature. Because human beings obviously are a part of nature. We exist in an environment. And that takes the form of primarily, on first approximation, we've got all of material observable nature comprises these 92 periodic, uh, these, these elements, right? Basic things. Plus, over time, what we've discovered is that we've been able to create a lot more. So there's about 27 other elements that don't exist in nature, but we've been able to create them and they fall in place on the periodic table of elements, up until <coughs> naturally 92 and then beyond. Now, over time, human beings have discovered more and more of these things, and it was Vernadsky's teacher, who was the guy who discovered the harmonic ordering principle that unites all of these different observable elements and gases in one system. That wasn't known before. It was sort of post hoc. People weren't sure if it was chaotic, if it was random, or if there was an order. There was an order, and it took a long time to discover. So Vernadsky said, okay, well, you got these things, you, got, you also have forces. You have immaterial processes, too, right? Nobody's ever seen life before. It's, it's immaterial. Uh, gravity, you can't see it. You can see its effects. Like, you know, when you see a compass, you see its, its little thing moving, but you don't see the actual field, not with your eyes at least. So it's like, okay, well, we've got these things going on. Now, do we live in an open system or closed system when you're thinking about the world? And that's, that's one question he holds in his mind. What is the nature of the system? He's, he's looking for the, because he knows that what, he can, what he's working on could completely revolutionize what human beings are and how we organize ourselves willfully. 
Now, what is really big is that he doesn't just stop there. He says, okay, well, not all atoms are equal. If I look at atoms that are located in, uh, in non-biotic nature, right, just things in rocks, that carbon and silicon in rocks is different from the carbon and silicon that I'll find in biotic nature. So it's, it's the same carbon, right, same silicon, same nitrogen that you might find in non-living versus like a plant, but they're doing two different things. They're being organized by two different principles. So their, their actions of these atoms are two different things. Same thing he says, well, when you take the other, there's this whole other category as well that I don't just, I can't just place into this category or that category. It's like there's another thing too that I seem to see and it, and it seems to be atoms organized by human thought. Do you guys know what I mean when I say atoms organized by human thought? I don't mean like little sculptures of like, you know, gold atoms or anything like that that look like, you know, art. I don't mean that, but what do you, what do you think? Uh, like creating ideas? Ideas are the cause, uh, but he's saying that but those aren't necessarily atoms. But, what, but like, would you say this table would have had to have had some ideas uh, to bring it into being? Or, yeah, it could just come off a tree, right? You can't just pluck a, tree off the, a table off a tree. So everything pretty much that you see around you, including your language, including the culture, but everything you see around you is, is the, what, what you could call fossils, thought fo idea fossils. Billions, if not trillions, of, of, of fossilized ideas in the, in the form of chemical synthesis for plastics, petroleum that goes into you know, the, the light, electricity. You, know, you, just try, you get dizzy trying to think about all of the different ideas that go into something simple like that camera. <laughs> it, it gets wild when you start just appreciating like, how many thoughts. Even though we don't know the names of all of the people who necessarily did that, these are actually these are these are shadows of the principle of the principle of, of, of action are thoughts, specific types of thoughts too, not just any old thoughts, but thoughts that reflect principles of the universe that are true because they actually allow us to transform the universe in a way that we can utilize to make both our lives better and has effects on the biosphere. Now Vernazzi saw the relationship of all three. Now the point is when it comes to the open versus closed system thing, that's no question. He starts his book on the biosphere, and he's the guy who coins the newest sphere and biosphere. He actually like, defines them scientifically. There were, there were words used before him, but this guy takes it to another like, level of intensity regarding his definition of what the biosphere actually is and the newest sphere actually is, and how that with the, the lithosphere, the domain of non-life, all interact in one universe. So, and you could like, go on Amazon, read the books, it's, it's intense. But he begins the biosphere book not by talking about the biosphere. He actually begins the first chapter in the biosphere book by starting with cosmic radiation, which is a, a very interesting way to begin something with the biosphere, right? So what the hell does that have to do with cosmic radiation? A lot. <laughs> um, so you don't have, like a lot of people are led to believe that the Earth is a closed system. You've got the sun, yeah, you've got the supernova, you've got the other stars out there, but that's other things. And we're we in our little vacuum here, in our, in our in our glass bowl in the earth with our atmosphere and you know, our fruits and stuff. <laughs> now that's, that's, that's sad that people think that way, but that's, that's a big thing. So what, what he points out is that you have of the 40 known, uh, what are called octaves of cosmic radiation, of, of electromagnetism, you have about eight of those octaves penetrating through the ozone layer, the atmosphere, the, elect the electromagnetic shield of the earth, which are very necessary that they be there or else we'd all be torn to shreds by violent cosmic radiation. So it's very good that we have this, this, this filtration, right? But he makes the point that these several octaves that also fall into the, uh, the radio waves, the radio, uh, radio wavelengths, optical are the, the ones we're most comfortable with. We've got some ultraviolet, we've got some infrared. This is the driver of evolutionary processes. So there's a certain force of evolution and he's making a point that it's being driven by this intersection of cosmic radiation that involves uh, charged particles of the entire periodic table that are being produced in stars and supernovae in our own sun that are intersecting through the Earth, through the poles primarily, where you have the aurora borealis, right? This is embedding itself over long periods of time in the cycles of change that we find in nature. And he goes through that. This is all, this is all part of in, in the 1920s in his biosphere book. And it's taken up by, by there's currents of schools that take this up and develop it but you won't find that very much in Western educational systems. There's been a certain acceptable, certain acceptable paradigms that are permitted into biological investigations in Western schools. That's not one of them. 
you kind of have to search that out on your own. <clears throat> but he's like, okay, well, what's the primary driver? What, knowing this, taking this context into consideration, what drives this process? What, right? Basic question: What, what are there any mechanisms that we can put our finger on, which don't change but that cause the change of these processes? So it's a fruitful line of, of, of inquiry, and he does indeed find some of these answers. Not all of them, but he finds some core ones. The one I'm going to point out, because it does have a, a, application to economic, uh, economic development and economic planning, if you're actually going to have a world of sovereign nation states working in harmony for a common interest based on real like, standards of what human beings are, this is, this is important. And he, he makes a point in 1937 that living matter is the bearer for and creator of free energy not existing to such a degree in any one of the Earth's envelopes. This free energy, biochemical energy, embraces the entire biosphere and fundamentally determines its entire history. Okay, so free energy basically just is that you, you know, it's not enough to say that you can't produce less than you consume if you don't want to collapse. It's not enough to say that. Even if you produce just as much as you consume, like let's say your system is consuming like that much energy, and you're consuming that much energy, and it's, it's equal, you're still screwed. Even if, if you try to like attain this like perfect balance, this perfect equilibrium of input output, you're still you're still going to destroy yourself. There's no free energy because all energy being used is going right back into like every and all every ounce of energy being produced is going right back into being utilized. So what happens if you have only a limited amount of like fresh water? or only limited amount of name or resource, right? If you're only keeping it at some equal balance, that's not, there's not gonna be more necessarily iron or whatever, right? Like there's only so much you can tap. At a certain point, you're draining that down. You're creating a collapse. That collapse point is still gonna be coming at you. You can slow it down a bit, but it's still gonna be coming at you. So the question here is what type of, what type of free energy do we see in nature? And what type of free energy do we see in human beings? Now, on first approximation, again, you, you look at just some of what's been pulled together by looking at some of the fossil records in the 1980s. You know, people have started realizing that fossils show some disturbing um, characteristics. I don't know if anybody's seen these big five extinction graphs before. You've all seen this stuff? No? Yeah? Yes? So this is, this is interesting. In the, in the early 80s, it was discovered that you don't have what you would, ex what, if you were just like a radical Darwinian, if that, was your, if that was what your ideology was, was to just, you were a radical Darwinian, who believed that survival of the fittest and the law of the jungle is what really animates the jungle's evolution. If you really believed that, you would expect to see gradual changes in uh, species. Like claws just getting like a little bit bigger as the, like, one species starts, you know, edging out the smaller clawed competitors for diminishing resources of food and like its female, you know, breeds. If, if, if you'd expect to see that, and that the, the ones that have like the smaller claws would just like disappear gradually as the bigger, and then so you would have like bigger feathers maybe coming out as they're, you know. So you, you don't see that though. What, what the disturbing thing is that you, as much as people have been trying to find these missing links, you don't tend to come across missing links so much. You tend to get systems of species which disappear, and then systems of species which we see coming into being. What the mechanism is, that's yet to be determined, but that's the, the discovery that led people to realize that there have been five major extinctions. There's been other extinctions, but five really big extinctions since the Cambrian, uh, since the, the Cambrian period, which is when life started really coming out of oceans and thriving. Yep. Is there a reason why you don't look at the pre-Cambrian era? Just this is more bountiful in life. There's, there's life, but it's much more boring to look at over the two billion years before that. Um, this is just the last 500 billion years where things really start speeding up. So there's something that happened with the Cambrian that just life started coming out of the water, right? It got a little bit more complex, so. <clears throat> but yeah, there, there's been these five major extinctions. Now, it seems when you look at this graph that what I just said about the free energy was not true. Because it seems like all of the, that, these cycles, right? These, what, these, what we're seeing here are 60 million year cycles. Um, it seems like these are being kept over a relative uh, equilibrium point, right? Like you could say that this is, this is like an equilibrium. 
which all of these ups and downs of the sine wave are being calibrated by. So it doesn't look like more free energy is being created in that graph, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Just want to make sure the, the data is the amount of species. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The genera, both in oceans and on land. Mm -hmm. And that includes also plants. Abundancy, relative abundance. Relative abundances. Relative. Yeah. So <clears throat> the biggest one was obviously what killed the dinosaurs between the uh, Cretaceous tertiary. That was a really bad one. Again, we don't really know exactly what caused these things. It seems to be that there's a variety of factors. You've got volcanic activity, you've got cosmic radiation. Some, and in fact, cosmic radiation is one of those things which you'll find also coincides with these cycles. Every, every cycle of, uh, of 60 to 140 million years, you have a lot of cosmic radiation coming into the Earth. Then there's less, then there's more. Um, ice ages are another issue. These are also peri periodic over these bigger cycles. You won't get that if you don't take a broad perspective, though. If you're just looking at it from the standpoint of like the last 300 years of, of climatology, you won't see any of that shit. So you have to take like the hole in your mind first before you look at a part. That's another thing that you don't get a lot in, in school today in climatology. They, there's a big focus on specialized parts, not, not looking at the hole first. That's a problem. But point being is, it seems like what I said was a lie that there is in fact no free energy and it's just going back to square one. But when you actually take a broad step out, you realize that that's not true. It, it actually is the case that you have way more species coming into being, and not just more, but more complex, qualitatively uh, different species, which have higher capabilities than the previous sets coming into being over time, leading us into the present. So you do have a higher growth function. Even though you've got these ups and downs, you do have a higher growth function that's animating this process of, of life. Another aspect of the free energy thing that, that Bernanski gets at is photosynthesis. He's like, the thing, you, the thing you can't ignore is the driver of the creation of photosynthesis, which has been there continuously, even though you've got all these like ups and downs, photosynthesis has always been there as far as these processes are observable. And what is it? It's the, it's the re relationship between living things, living matter, and the sun, right? So the free energy, the free ambient energy of the sun, is absorbed by photosynthesis, which then can use that, use its its chlorophyll molecule, to break down certain things like, you know, carbon dioxide. It creates carbohydrates this way. You release oxygen, the free oxygen as well. He's making the he, Vernonsky makes the point that you wouldn't have an, an ozone layer or an atmosphere had it not been for the appearance of photosynthesis as a biological technology. So if nature hadn't had this creative power of organizing itself in such a way to exhibit chlorophyll? No atmosphere, no ozone layer. Just a lot of deadly cosmic radiation coming in and killing us, not, not allowing the Earth to be very hospitable for further forms of advanced life. So that, that, that's very key. Now, there's an additional aspect of this that Bernatsky gets at where he says that it, the free energy stimulates and radically transforms the intensity of the migration of the chemical elements which compose the biosphere and determine its geological significance. All right, I'm going to show you a graph to exhibit what that means. Uh, does this make certain sense to people so far? Does there, you guys know what it means when he says that you've got the intensity of the migration of chemical elements which compose the biosphere, that that increases? You guys have a, can you guys imagine what that might mean? So the carbon goes into the trees and yeah. makes the tree and all the chemicals are just building and moving around, getting displaced by yeah. population of animals move and die there. And exactly. So that, that process of, like, uh, like Phil was saying, you've got gases, you've got, you've got liquid, solid, and gas coming into every organism, whether it's a tree or whether it's you, right, that's coming into you. You're breathing it out, doing other things to get it out, right? and you're doing other things to get it in. And there's this constant flux in every organism as, as well as within every species. Now, what he's getting at is that as you go into more advanced species, this power of transmitting the, um, the atoms of nature, of the ambient environment, through the organisms and back out in a different form, because it's not the same form when you, when you breathe it out. Like when you take something into yourself and you let it come out of you, it's not the same molecule, it's going to be a different molecule, right? But that power of recycling, of processing that flow of what he calls the migration of atoms, 
is increasing in intensity. And one of the ways you can see it is by looking at the ratio of animals with higher metabolic rates relative to animals with lower metabolic rates in these same geological epochs. So you have these points of relative stabilization where there's a minimum and maximum boundary around which uh, these species come into being and disappear. And that's very different from the next phase of or the next system, you could say, which is, again, different from the next system, which is always moving towards higher metabolic uh, species that are becoming more dominant, and the lesser ones, less so. Example, um, reptiles, right? Reptiles will basically, are, are they more or less metabolic, yeah, metabolically active than mammals? Less, less much, right? So <clears throat> they're, the, the, they don't need as many carbohydrates and these other denser forms of fruits and other things and plants that the mammals do require to sustain their, their, their heat, their ability to modulate themselves into colder climates, which is why the animals that, that are of a higher form, that are newer, more newly appeared on the earth, like mammals, they have a greater freedom of mobility to go into hostile environments where reptiles, they're not going to be able to move around that much into like the cold. Right? They die really quickly if you put an alligator in like Alaska. No, but a, a bear could really get, get along pretty well. So you, you've got this greater freedom of motion, freedom of expressing certain, certain emotions as well, which I think is also something that should be taken in, into consideration. Um, a specific example of that, um, you can just see like one of many examples are the articulated brachiopods and bi bivalve mollusks. I'm just using one example, just, just to, but there's many that you could look at. They do the same thing, same predators, same prey in the oceans, except the difference being that this bivalve mollusk didn't really get hit with this ex mass extinction cycle that wiped out a lot of other species, including its, uh, its cousin, <coughs> which completely plummeted. Right? So this, they, both, they both coexist today. This one's hardly, this one's really rare. This one you see all over the place. What's the difference? Why did this one thrive and that one didn't? Now again, we don't know what's going on, right? This is just allowing our minds to start like hypothesizing what the, what the hell the universe is doing to the Earth that permits this process to occur, right? That's what we want to do, is we want to make hypotheses that will actually be able to, to, to be tested so that we don't, this doesn't happen to us. <laughs> um, but this has about a 10 times greater metabolic power than the articulated brachiopods. Its ability to process its food into its own um, like energy that it does for work is 10 times greater than the other one. That's one sign. All right, so this brings us back to mankind. So Vernadsky, um, in his paper on the evolution of species and living matter, most of these papers, by the way, you guys can get on our website, the, the LaRoofPack.com website, in their original. So you guys can just like study this on your own, and it's really worthwhile. Um, <clears throat> it's a bit longer, but I, it's a worthwhile quote as he ends this paper on a few thoughts about the implications on what, what human beings have to be... Cons how do you have to reconceptualize what we actually are, pretty much, based upon what he's you know, developing? Um, <clears throat> so he ends by saying, It seems that this study opens before us yet another domain of the phenomenon of scientific activity, until now exclusively reserved to the speculations of philosophy or religion. The new form of biogenic migration, at least new to this scale, was provoked, as we see, by the intervention of human reason. However, it does not distinguish itself in any of the other manifestations of biogenic migration, which are connected to other vital functions. <clears throat> we can, at the same time, establish in a precise way that human thought changes in a sharp and radical way the course of natural processes, and modifies that which we call the laws of nature. Consciousness and thought despite the efforts of generations of thinkers and wise men, cannot be reduced to either energy or matter, however we define these bases of our scientific thought. How can consciousness act on the work of the natural processes which seem to be entirely reducible to energy and matter? It is probable that we will not be able to resolve this question until after having radically changed our fundamental physical notions notions which have undergone and still undergo transformations with a rapidity for which we know of no prior examples in the history of thought. 
So, I mean, this is, this is a big deal, right? Because it's true, it's a paradox. If, if, if ideas themselves don't have, you can't weigh them, they don't seem to be a form of energy as we know energy, or they're not material as such. They have material shadows, as this thing proved. Um, how is it possible that they can actually shape the material world? Um, <clears throat> that's one question he throws up. The other one is, is thought natural or not, right? Like, how, if, if thought is natural, because th this is the thing with the green movement today, one of the big fallacies of why we, what we're dealing with, both with the, the free market economic thinkers that define us as an animal in, a, in an each against all survival of the fittest system, where the weak just have to like suffer and die while the strong carry forth the wealth. In the right-wing psychopaths there, as well as in a lot of uh, people who've been duped into going to the opposite left-wing extreme, which you see it manifest in the fact that uh, you've got the depopulation movement, for example, right? Like a lot of the, a lot of the green organizations today, sadly, uh, advocate the idea that mind is something outside of nature. Because when the mind is being creative and reasonable and making discoveries of the laws of nature, we change nature. You green a desert. Right? You, you don't just wait till the desert crops up and, and, and just uh, kills you. you. You can actually tackle the problem of the desertification by bringing a desert. You can, you can do other things too. You can create more electricity if you don't have enough by damming a, a, a river and making electricity happen. And, you know, you could do things like that. You could tap into the atom. But of course, like we established, every time you go to a higher power to sustain life, you could also, if you're immoral, if you're governed by a moral principle, you you'll also be able to use that power to destroy life. There's a, a dual side to every, every upshift in technology. Now the problem is, again, the Green Movement defines that every change in nature is absolutely a bad, and have this idea that there's this pristine equilibrium in nature that we should aspire to, which involves probably allowing a big chunk of a few billion people of the Earth to just maybe disappear, because we're just overpopulated anyway. Like David Suzuki, for example, right? Some guy, everybody in Montreal loves David Suzuki, but if you ever actually have a conversation to him and, with him and ask him, as, as my friend David did not that long ago, what his ideal is for how many humans should be allowed to exist on the earth, he'll say straight up without blinking, 200 million. That's a lot of dead people. Like that's, that's a lot of people who have to disappear. He's not gonna go into details of how he wants them to disappear, maybe in personal conversation, but I mean, there are certain implications to thinking that, especially if you put it into action. So, uh, the question becomes, all right, how do we actually organize around a truer idea of what the human mind naturally does when it's in a healthy, mature state versus when it's in a neurotic, uh, a neurotic state of that's the effect of being in a consumer society that doesn't produce anything. Um, a couple of key points, again, that make some people just, you, you think it's almost self-evident, but it's not. Are these things natural or not natural? Corn, right? We all love corn. Is it natural? Not really, not technically, yeah, but it, if you're a greenie, you know, like if you're a hardcore, you know, greenie, no, you, you would say it's not natural because it's produced by human thought. But if you if take the opposing view that, no, maybe actually human thought is natural when it's selecting and judging and, you know, planning for the future, maybe in that case you could say that this is actually natural. Because this is Teosente, right? You see this in South America, that, that is not something you want to eat. That's maize, that's more edible, but that's corn, that's stuff you buy at the store, and that's, that has a lot of nutrients in it. Um, your basic farm animals, you, you try to, if you want to free a, a cow, if you have sympathy for the cow and you want to free that cow back into nature, you're not doing it in any favors whatsoever. Because that cow did not develop its, its identity in nature. It was created by generations of selective breeding by human thoughts for a purpose. Um, cute little, I mean, geez, they, we wouldn't have cats, we wouldn't have kittens if the human mind didn't do this, right? A, a lion will, will rip your heart out. Um, if you want to try to keep them in your, in your household. And the same thing for fruits, right? These, these things, fruits don't just exist in nature. Apples don't just exist in nature. They're the effects of many thousands of years, if not more, of human thought organizing itself to select better and better uh, tastiness in, the, in the, what they want from, you know, the, take a little crab apple in nature, it's not going to take you very far. To the point that you can get these delicious strawberries and stuff. Um, <clears throat> Now it's not just it's not just nature per se. It's you you can also speed up the, the bigger processes of, of greening a desert. Like this is only a period of about 14 years in an area of Saudi Arabia, 
where you've actually been able to take something which is very has a very low biogenic migration of atoms, the amount of like gaseous elements and, and atoms in the biosphere. There's not a lot of motion happening here. This is actually very analogous to the surface of Mars. It's like a very boring area, uh, very hostile to life. And in a period of, of a little over a decade, you've been able, through just thinking through the future, you've been able to actually make this area blossom where there's now a much, much more higher flux, not just of, of, of uh, atoms, but also of a cooling because every single area, these are huge zones of agriculture. Every single circle is a huge, massive zone of agriculture. Every single plant sweats and creates a cooling effect as well because where you have greenery, you have more cloud coverage. Where you don't have greenery, where you have a lot of desert, you don't have a lot of clouds. Right? So where you have a lot of clouds, you also have a lot of, but you have a natural cooling. That's a fact too. That's a this byproduct of taking water that's locked way down below the desert and just bring it to the surface. Now the problem is always is we know that there's still a limited amount of water under the surface. You're not going to be able to get that out there forever. So either we settle on the fact that um, water is limited and we're going to have to tighten our belts and allow for a little depopulation here or there and you know some scientific priesthood or another is going to have to come up and decide what the acceptable quantity of people will be. It gets pretty morally tough now at this point. Or you can unleash human creativity. Because how, how else can you get water and food where currently there are none? If you don't want to kill people. Right? How, where else do we get water from if we don't have enough water? Wait, who said that? How do you create water? Um, what's it called? Two hydrogen, one oxygen? You can do that, right? You can create it. You can desalinate it too. We've got a lot of it we can't use. Yeah, exactly. So that requires, uh, how many windmills does it require uh, or, or solar panels to desalinate a bulk water from oceans. You can't do it actually. It, you, you, as many as you want, the type of energy density required to separate, to have a reverse osmosis to separate the, the salt from the water and move that water into places useful, you're not going to get that density of heat from either of those energy sources. Which is why the BRICS countries are going with nuclear power because they want to do things. If you don't want to do things, if you just want a consumer society that doesn't do anything and just like has enough like electricity for your refrigerator and your TV. Okay, windmills and solar panels might be your thing. But if you want to do things, that's not going to work. And that's why you get this big discrepancy right now in energy policy between these two countries, or between these two systems. Um, this brings us up to the third aspect, because what Vernadsky's saying is that you don't just change the laws of nature, you can actually accelerate the space time. Because frankly, you, you could say that deserts would, would green, and that we have seen examples of deserts greening naturally over thousands of years. But we don't have to wait that long. We can, as we saw, we can wait 10 years, we can wait less. Um, you can accelerate the natural flow of, of organic time if you're thinking in a certain type of way. What you're seeing here is a plasma. It's the fourth state of matter. Liquid, solid, gas, plasma. This is something which humans do. So, so far before humans, only suns have been exhibited to do these things. That creates a lot of um, energy. These are millions of degree heat. So hot that the electrons have already broken off of the atoms inside, and any single element can be brought into a plasma, where the electrons, by falling off, you get positive charged. You know, it's called a well, plasma. You get a positive charge uh, process. If you, you, it's so hot that it would melt this whole whatever equipment you want to build. So you need intense magnetic fields. It takes a lot of energy, but you can now, if you want to do work, this is this is gold. This is better than gold, right? If you actually want to be selling at ocean water. Plasma, like actually utilizing multi-million degree heats and deploying it towards, you know, literally you can green a desert in the Sahara can blossom in like 10 years. You can look at Mars and you could start actually working through how do you make Mars blossom in like 70 years. I get like little sprouts. You can actually think that way. Right now we can't think that way because we don't have this technology. It doesn't exist. Well, it exists, but we can't use it. It's not, you know, best friends. But it, we have some ways to go before we can actually make this. Uh, useful for the broader part of society, but this is the direction that Russia, China, India are committed to by virtue of the programs that we see being put in place. Especially the, um, what do we begin with? The, uh, the mining of the moon for helium-3, right? Helium-3 is the best source to initiate one of these processes. The question then becomes also uh, the creation of new elements. So by doing this, the elements on the periodic table, their natural evolution, we don't have to wait millions of years for, for plutonium to just come into being. We can create it. 
by having like free neutrons that we can then organize for the sake of creating whole, like everything after 92, like I said, doesn't exist in nature. Humans do that. Um, but all of a sudden they have qualities that we can then utilize for medical resources, for all sorts of things that you would just not be able to have the option to naturally. So both the lithosphere, the biosphere, the newosphere are not in equilibrium. Their nature is to change into higher states of organization towards making life better, both for, well, for the whole thing, right? For the universe as a whole. Because really what we're dealing with is a universal phenomenon. And, that's, and human beings are the only species that can think about the universe. It, we may not know what we're talking about, <laughs> but we, we can have an idea, a concept of the universe, and it can self-perfect itself over time. And that says a lot. So when we're choosing to like, organize our identities and what we want to do with the course of the small period of time that we're alive, we could choose to just be little hedonists going moment to moment right, until the system collapses, and then what the hell was that all about? Or we can choose voluntarily to take on a broader context both into the history of human history as well as into the geological history. We can think as far into the future as we want, and we can situate how we choose to invest our time and energy in that process if we're wise. And if we're not, well, so the dinosaurs, I mean, they can attest to what happens when you don't change, when you adapt a little bit too well to a, a low flux density environment, right? These dinosaurs are not going to have, they, they never developed NASA. So um, I'm going to end with a little 10 minute video, which um, I wish Pascal was here because he knows how to work this thing better than I do, but I pray that I can figure this out. And then Dave will be able to finish this up. Oh. So bad. Eight, seven, six, four. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Mankind is now on the verge of a great new era, the fusion economy. The prospect now exists for a global economic revolution centered upon the high technology development of the Pacific region, driven by advanced infrastructure and the development of fusion power and technologies. In this series of videos, we present the path to this new era, one in which the common aims and common desires of all mankind will finally become the central objectives of international relations, and the creative powers unique to the human species can finally be unleashed across the globe and throughout the solar system. Fusion will provide an effectively unlimited supply of power, creating the basis for a fundamentally new economy. The benefits are not limited to simply providing more power for the processes which already exist in the current system. The fusion economy creates the basis for addressing resource needs far into the future. To understand this, we must first recognize that, for mankind, resources are not self-evident, they are not self-determined, and they are not actually natural. What are often sloppily called natural resources only become resources as a function of the technology and energy flux density of the economy. Start with a few examples. In the first half of the 19th century, the United States had a thriving fuel and chemical industry. Its primary feedstock? Whale oil. While the most common use was the burning of whale oil in lamps for lighting, Applications extended as far as for soaps, margarine, lubricants, paint, varnish, and for the processing of textiles and ropes. By its peak mid-century, hundreds of ships were bringing millions of gallons of whale oil to the U.S. market each year. An immense amount of work, finding, hunting, skinning, and processing the largest animals on the planet to provide light for your home. By the 1850s, methods were beginning to be developed to bring a new resource into use, petroleum. Prior to this, petroleum in the United States was relatively useless, even proving a nuisance when it filled mines dug for other purposes. 
When new methods for distillation of crude oil were developed, the separation and concentration of a new fuel became possible, kerosene. With this, the whale oil industry was quickly replaced and the petrochemical industry was started. Technological advance drove the shift to an entirely new resource base. Or take one of the most important resources currently in use, fuel for the baseload electricity and energy needs of the economy. Pound for pound, the most energy-dense, efficient, and effective energy supplies immediately available are the fission fuels of uranium, thorium, and plutonium, tens of thousands of times more energy-dense than coal or oil. One hundred years ago, these elements were nearly useless, an undistinguished constituents of dirt or rock, with some uranium finding a small role in tinting the color of glass. It was scientific discovery, the understanding of the atom, of fission processes, and of the equivalence of matter and energy discovered by Einstein, which changed these elements from nondescript components of dirt and rock into resources, specifically the best power source mankind had ever known, at least up to that point. Today, we sit on the verge of an even greater revolution, the ability to use a fuel an order of magnitude more energy-dense than uranium that promises to provide effectively unlimited power for all mankind. The physical resources for this are all around us, isotopes of hydrogen produced from ocean water and rock. But the ability to turn such mundane things as these into a revolution for all mankind lies in the application of man's unique understanding of thermonuclear fusion. The fuel available in one gallon of ocean water can provide as much energy as 300 gallons of petroleum, fulfilling our energy needs far into the future. Take a related example, this time of elements we do know how to use, but which are not part of our resource base because of an inability to access them. The United States stretches across nearly 3.8 million square miles. If we examine any single cubic mile of dirt, on average it contains many times the United States' annual production of key resources. For tin, an average cubic mile of dirt contains 100 times the amount produced in the U.S. each year. For zinc, it is about six times. For iron, the element most used by weight, it's about eight times. And for aluminum, our nondescript mile of earth contains 200 times the U.S.'s annual production. Even with a fusion economy, we probably won't need to process random dirt. However, this example makes the point that the resources are there. It is up to us to figure out how to use them. The challenge results from a lack of technology, not of material. One technology illustrating the potentials of a fusion economy is the fusion torch. Already by the end of the 1960s, detailed designs showed that the extreme high temperatures of a fusion reaction could revolutionize materials processing. The plasma of a fusion reaction, reaching many millions of degrees, could be directed into a separate channel where any material could be dropped in and broken down into its constituent elements. These separated elements can then be concentrated and released as new raw materials. As a general concept, if the systems were eventually built to handle large volumes of material, effectively any trash or economic waste could be processed, perhaps allowing landfills to become excellent resources, containing materials we already use at concentrations far higher than those mined. Even before the development of the full-scale systems which depend upon a sustained fusion reaction, the technologies of the 1970s already made possible the creation of lower-temperature plasma torches and plasma processing systems 
fully capable of breaking down and reprocessing things ranging from hazardous chemical waste to spent nuclear fuel to scrap metal, extracting valuable raw materials from each. Going one step further, with the much higher energy levels available in a fusion economy, transmutation, changing one element into another, can become a regular economic practice. Many radioactive isotopes are extremely valuable for medical and other purposes. Those which are not useful can be transformed into other stable elements, eliminating the need for storage. If there are critical elements we need, some could be created from other, more abundant elements with similar weights. Gold can be converted into platinum, mercury can become gold, and alchemy can become part of the economy. These capabilities define the next step in the natural self-evolution of the human species. The history of mankind has been defined by successive transitions to higher forms of fire, driving the increased energy flux density of the economy per capita and per area. Now, we stand at the verge of the next step. With the shift to a full-scale fusion economy, mankind's existence on this planet is revolutionized as the concerns over limited power, limited fuel, and limited resources are subdued by the power of human scientific thought. outside of the political conditions of the world that we're living in. So if you live under an empire, it's, it goes without saying that every aspect of the world that you live in, be it the media, be it the, uh, the cultural programming, the educational systems, are going to reflect that same imperial uh, policy top down. So that's why there's a, there's a certain handicap in our population to jump be, behind the surface of things to look at what is the underlying intention, what is the agenda moving us in a certain direction. Because if people did have that basic capability, which animals don't have, by the way, animals don't have that, what I, what I just mentioned, animals don't do that. They, they have a certain adaptive quality, there's a certain natural creative instinct that is very useful for them, it's very good, but they can't leap outside of their senses and tap into a sense of causality. So gravity is not something that you know uh, a pigeon is going to discover. They're going to react to the electromagnetic field of the earth, but they're not going to discover the laws of electromagnetism, gravity, they're not going to be able to change their behavior through any act of will, that's just not what they're going to do. Whereas human beings, the fact that we, doesn't mean, we do, doesn't mean that human beings do this, but the fact that we have exhibited a quality that separates us from other animals in that we have this power if we choose to develop it, is very special. And what I'm going to be going through with my presentation that I just chose to call the end of closed system geopolitics and the rise of open system development is going to touch on this scientific idea of what human beings actually are. Um, if you think about the idea of a neoliberal economic system of free trade economics, uh, you, you, you look then at all the, the idea of geopolitics. What we teach in, if you go to a... Hey, uh, so I'll, I'll go through a lot of material over the next 40 minutes or so, and uh, I'll end with a certain video that was recently produced by our team. Uh, we have a science team working with our organization in the United States. Um, I'm going to be following up on what JP said, by, but first before I begin my actual uh, presentation, which is going to go through a lot of material, and I really do hope I can get it done in a dense amount of time. Um, I'm assuming it's not a, a big revelation or surprise for people here to discover that we live in a neoliberal economic system. That's popular to say that, right? It's, it's not working. That doesn't function, right? That's common, commonly understood by all. Um, if I said that at the heart of it, there, that it's based upon an idea of social Darwinism, would that make any sense to people or is there confusion there? That there's a social Darwinistic uh, ideology underpinning the system. That makes sense, right? No, not so much? Okay, well, in the current system, 
Um, do you know the principle, or have you heard of this idea of each against all, the survival of the fittest? Yeah. Do you, rec do, do you see how that uh, concept justifies the expansion of monopolies like Monsanto, you know, major uh, corporate interests, right? You, you recognize that, right? The reason why I'm saying that is that a lot of people, uh, mm -hmm. they don't think about the system in which they live in. There's sort of like a, series of, a bunch of rules, a bunch of customs that you're born into, and you don't really think too deeply about the ideas and concepts underlying it. Um, that's partially to do with the fact that our education system is not some ivory tower objective place of learning. Uh, political science programs that you learn about geopolitics. You guys heard about geopolitics? Yeah? Okay, what, what does that mean to you guys? Geopolitics. What do you got? Okay, that's that's a, that's a, that's one one approach. Yeah, every every country has its own customs and rules that interact with each other. Um, underlying that, the idea of geo of the earth, politics of the earth, it pretty much uh, the geography. This is where the idea originally came from a hundred years ago, with a, a major imperialist and a racist named Lord, Lord Halford Mackinder, who formulated this whole school of thought. His idea was that well, look, the earth is pretty much everything is discovered. Everything that could be discovered has been discovered and now it's just a question of the powerful or the, the most genetically fit to rule mapping out everything else and managing the diminishing resources knowing that you have these different cultures that have their own quirks, their own customs and you know the idea if you're truly the the most fit will be to have the control of the, um, of what are called the geopolitical pivots, right? If you can control the maritime routes of trade, which is what the British Empire always did, if you can control profile cultures and have them play against each other so that they have artificial wars for you know, water, for oil, whatever, they're gonna be so busy fighting each other that they're not gonna realize that they're all being played by the same forces who maybe they both think is their friends, right? And this goes back to a very, this is an old formula. It's gotten a little bit more complex in recent years, but it's the same old formula since Babylon. You play the slaves against each other so that they don't disappear. Well, you got to pump, pump the banks, you know, with more of the more quantitative easing. You got to flood it with liquidity. Now, where does that debt go? That private, privately incurred losses in the private sector, these major monopoly, too big to fail banks, they don't just disappear. What's been happening now is that you had the private debts transferred onto the public shoulders. This is where, the, if you want to get at the heart of why we have austerity, it's because you've got a system where private speculators have been con tricking people into uh, bringing, pu making public those losses and then convincing us that it's our fault and we have to submit to the you know, blood-curdling austerity in everything that actually has real value. Now the, the key part and that Baruch has been saying is the, the key to the reason why he has been able to, as a 92-year-old scientist, the reason why he has been able to go on record for five decades and make long-term forecasts about what the economy is doing is not magic, it's the fact that he's just simply paying attention to the most important variable, which is the physical, economic, input, output, industry, science, and infrastructure. Right? This is, again, this is not magic, this is not esoteric, this is basic science. If you have 7 billion people on the earth, you cannot produce enough food for 6 billion or 5 billion while having money go up. So you can't contract your means of sustaining life while making money happen and expect that money to be worth anything. If you do that and if you let any rules get ingrained that permits that process to happen as we see right there, where you have like literally about two quadrillion dollars of derivative contrast, contracts, actually think, think together, okay. Now we're coming to an end of that system. What's collapsing now is a system that does not define, the imperial system does not define any differentiation between animal life in the biosphere and human life. We are just another form of animal and all we're supposed to do under the imperial ethic is adapt to whatever system we're born into. We're not allowed to question if that's true or not. We just have to adapt to it, try to get ahead, right? try to have more, make more money than the, the weaker, and then you die and there's no real other purpose beyond that. Now that's the imperial ethic. That's what, when you're looking at what's collapsing right now in Europe and the in North America, especially with the austerity, with the bailouts, uh, you've got a system which LaRouche in the 90s first illustrated, in this form at least, um, as the, what's called the triple curve. 
This doesn't mean that everything you need to know about economy is, is illustrated here. But this means that the, the primary elements of what are, what's driving us towards a collapse can be understood through this, this mechanism, but through this graph. What this graph is, as people see, are three variables. Right? This is what we're living in. You got monetary aggregates. As you know, since 2008, when our economy collapsed, then we, we created a bailout economy to replace what we used to have as an economy. That, those monetary flows have just been increasing. We've been pumping out over 27 trillion of dollars in five years just to keep the banks from collapsing. That's big. What's, what they've been pumping out and trying to bail out are these uh, derivative contracts, speculative contracts that people are realizing they thought they had value. They have no value. They're, they're associated with debts that are not payable. So as these things just